maybe share a little bit of that experience with you and, uh, and to show you some ideas about how you might want to organise yourself to, to lead into that discussion. Um, my specialist area of work, where I get, in, in, uh, where I get asked the most to, to interfere, is in the area of complex needs. I don't know if you know those really annoying people that don't neatly fit in a box, or in a pathway, or in a particular service. Uh, I, it's a lovely phrase that the only person fits in a convenient box is a dead one. Everybody else you've got to work with, haven't you? Uh, I, I do that by creating space, you know, literally often space to think, or sometimes just a better space to work in. I go into places and say, oh God, it's a tight here. It's a mess. And it can be as simple as that sometimes. Is that I, first of all, I'd like you to, to look at these two lists of words. Um, these were taken from a rather clever piece of software the text mind organizations and said what sort of things they talk about. Um, they've been put together in the pink and the green, um, not so that they're opposites, or, but they're, they're similar, they go together. But as you read down those two lists, I'd like you to think of which side do you prefer? Imagine these were organisations. Which one would you rather work in? A pink one or a green one? Green. Green? Green? green. I've used this little slide in literally <coughs> hundreds of audiences over a long time. And almost universally people say, I'd like to work in the green one. But the red isn't evil, is it? It's just green to nicer place, isn't it? And I like this one. People and process. Of course people are more, more important than processes. But if you haven't got any processes, Nothing happens. So it's kind of, I'd like to live here and use a bit of this when it's useful. Does that kind of make sense? Uh, you might be familiar with the type of organisation that, um, that uses those words. They look like that. I don't know if you've seen these diagrams before. They're called pyramid diagrams. Because this was the, that was the first place they were ever found, not pyramids. And what they were used for is to determine how much to pay people. But at the top here, in a big girl hat, you were fairer. Fairer in the <laughs> chair. Very important. Nah, -ha, been here a long time. Lovely to be here. Well, am I? And this chap here, clearly in charge. Very, very important. As two architects, you know, clearly professional chap is also very, very important. And then beneath them, they've got wick crackers. And then beneath them, they've got shovelers. And with the shovelers, you standardise the work, you demote it to value, you don't pay them very much. Does that, does that make sense? Have you got a sense of where you might fit in an organisation now? And what happens normally is when somebody comes to the top of this, by the way, in big institutions, public sector institutions, these guys last only two years on average. So what they say is there will be no top-down reorganisation this year. That's what they say. And because they don't understand the nature of the business they've ended up in charge of, the first thing they do is they switch around the people and talk to them. <laughs> and then those people say they go against bastards. So they turn around to the people who report there and they start rearranging them. I don't know if you've been involved in this, this is called transformational change. <laughs> what happens is all the middle managers disappear into a meeting room and come out 18 months later all wearing each other's badges. <laughs> <laughs> See that? Fortunately, because you only last two years, but the time it's got down to, down to this level, that looks changed again. <laughs> so it never quite reaches the shoulders at the bottom, we've got to carry on doing the same old shit they've always done. <laughs> this is the theory of an organisation. It's not really very useful. The only organisation that uses this shape in reality is the military. They legitimately use this because that general at the top needs to know the chain command to tell that chap to pull his trigger. Really important. But the military don't use this kind of structure to manage themselves when they're not at war. Because it's a very useless way of managing an organisation. Now I've worked for several health boards and local authorities and I've seen more of these bloody diagrams than you can stick up. I'm wondering who the hell we're at war with. It must be the citizens, truly. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine an account of these going like this? I can put a code in that box. Oh, I can divide it into two codes. Oh. You've done it all to himself. I can put it into four codes in smaller boxes. I can put something in a grey suit to each other's boxes. Every different stick is not better than another. Oh, it's lush. I bet you you're real drunk. <laughs> Don't they? Yeah. That's actually how you do work, isn't it? Because, mainly because you are a bunch of sneaky, lying little cheats, aren't you? Because you know how the world actually
actually works. But you kind of know the way to work around the system because you kind of work there. You've been there, haven't you? So you know what to know. <coughs> now what's funny, one of these little lines breaks and you lose a connection or something, you find nine other ways of getting around and doing the things you want to do anyway, do you? <laughs> and what happens is these guys create policies that try to stop you going down all these different routes. What do you do? <coughs> you make even more routes. <laughs> By making friends with people. Have you ever done that? You got to be friends with somebody at work and found that to be more useful than a policy. <laughs> of course, that's a network. See that, mate? Lots of different connections with people. Interestingly, in you, the people are the structure. In this, what do you want for friends? The people who represent friends are going to be here. It stands for broker. These are the people who know to broker their way around the system. I'll give you this if you give me that. I'll go there, you do this. We'll try that. Tell you what, we'll meet you around the back at the end of the day. Repeat your memory. Nice. Uh, so this this is, gives you freedom, but not complete freedom. There are some things you've got to go into and out of, but it gives you ability to move around. Uh, what we're taught is um, this is kind of strange way of thinking. That's very rational and linear, isn't it? That's how we make decisions in organisations. You add up everything to a final answer, and that's the correct answer. And this is more holistic when you've got to consider all the things and all the factors, and you can't you can't see the whole system from any one position within it. And, and actually what that's considered to be is that's his proper grown-up work and this is some mad hippie, isn't it? That's what that holistic is about, mad hippies running around in the fields and in communes. And these things are supposed to fight with each other, that you can't, you're either rational or holistic. And most processes are like the left thing, are they? And most people are like the right thing. So you even end up fighting in your own organisation, don't you? Have you ever tried to do something really simple and it's been extraordinarily difficult to do? In, in, the, in the health service, sorry, any health service we do, um, recruitment. <laughs> oh my word! You've got to, you've got to plan twelve months in advance, right? Eighteen. Oh my word! And there are more forms to fill in than ever. But you know, recruitment became really difficult when personnel changed from being personnel to being HR. <laughs> you understand? Know that? I'm not going to use now. Um, and what you end up is with this. Are you familiar with this technique of management? Are you familiar with this? This bloke has probably got a degree in, I don't know, French political history, 1761 to 1765. Uh, he's been dropped into some local authority system he knows nothing about, and he ends up in Jack and Cuba. He's got no idea what to do, so the only thing he can do is shout at people. Because uh, he believes in this, he's been taught to see this this move, right? That you are either live in this perfectly designed little ship of orbit, right? Bureaucracy of loveliness and filling forms in, or you live in this vast sea of chaos, and there's no alternative. And they love things like this. It's extra prizes if you could tell me what they mean. Anyone recognize any of those? Quality. Total quality, quality management. management. That's the oh, Can you imagine being on a course for that? Lean Six Sigma. Lean Six Sigma? Oh, yes. That's like, that's Lean Six Sigma. It's like the other with its pants outside its trousers. Like a special superhero for people who have burgers in them. <laughs> Business process engineering. Continuous improvement cycles. Who doesn't know those? Plan, do, study, act, isn't that? Or as it really means, plan, do, stop, applause. <laughs> <laughs> and this one, what I want to show this one, program budgeting margin analysis. That was invented by Google people and accountants working together. <laughs> and what they believe in is the process fallacy. You know that everything's a process, and you just design the process whether it'll work fine. Right? And uh, they don't realize that a process is defined by a very highly specified and predetermined endpoint. That's the definition of process. Because if it doesn't have a highly specified and predetermined endpoint, it isn't a process. Can you think of any other chain of events that isn't a process? That is another word, you all know the word. Huh? Life. Life. Yeah. It's called an experience, isn't it? You take a step, you get away anywhere, and you can look a step. You've got no idea where you're going to end up, but you know you're going to end up somewhere. Right? What we tend to do is, because this process fallacy exists in people's minds, you can specify everything in advance. We tend to kill really good work by trying to jam it in to a nice, neat, linear pyramid to a final answer when it's not like that. It doesn't work like that. And if you don't believe me, I'm telling the truth. This is Richard Pascal, Harvard Kennedy School of Government, a 25-year long study where they look for business stats. By the way, general management was invented about there. You know these people with general skills and how to manage everything? Might have been a liar. Huh? Let's talk about the management look. I love this one here, this is my favourite. You know, when, when we're talking about doing all this, all this lovely work, see, 
became good, so they reinvented it in all different sorts of companies called the Business Process Reengineering. Oh, it's fabulous. Theory X and Theory Y, you remember those? Theory X is an object in because they supervise. Theory Y is in the natural land, the real world. This is great, isn't it? All those facts. And what you end up is with this. Because none of those processes never work, do they? Because we deal with lives, not processes. So then, then these guys come out. Have you met any leaderships? Oh, have you been on a leadership course? I, I don't know if therapy because you moved just one. It's a back to the real world, you know. But if you've got certain characteristics, you're splendid. If you haven't got certain characteristics which fit with the side of the moment, then you can't spend it. I love like, to like it. When you find these lovely nurses in different parts of the world, the nurse obviously in the public view is heavenly. Not only find a nurse who's doing great work, they then call her a leader. Oh, she's a leader. If you find a nurse doing shit work, they don't call her a leader then, they call her a nurse. <laughs> you don't that. They only like the good stuff. And what they do is they'll say they'll release all things to you. Have you seen these? Do you recognize this in me? Have you been through the process? Are you alright? <laughs> Does anyone, anyone know their four letters? This is the Myers Briggs type indicator. Yeah. Oh, this is it. This is a contrived load of absolute fairness about what kind of person you are. You fill in a 120 page questionnaire yeah. and it tells you what your personality is like. And therefore, don't laugh. We spend over £90,000 a year in you know, grades on this work. And it tells you that you're one of eight letters, or I'm an INTJ, you know, and therefore you're only suited to particular kinds of work and not others. And don't laugh in America, they recruit people on the basis of this absolute Codsworth. <laughs> uh, it's a really great work done by IBM around their large organization, which proved that Myers Briggs is slightly less accurate than astrology <laughs> <laughs> as an indicator of success in work. Honest to God, the drip work. And, and what you get is leadership is on tour. They know you can be able to money at it. Because if you're not a part of the solution, it's good money to be made. You belong in the problem, isn't it? I don't know if you've been through one of these kind of uh, cycles. They happen every eight years. If you wonder what you're going to do next year, just look back seven and copy and paste that ocean. It doesn't take for that long. It takes two. It takes two voting seasons. Because the current politicians can't do the last ones today, so you've got to do what's next before that. What do you get is this. If you've been stood here and stuck there where people present culture to you, and that's the problem. Culture is a cold word, but I've got absolutely no idea what to do. And then it's sort of like vision. Mm, you must have, you must have a compelling vision. I promise you, if I have a vision, I am often assessment and a warm sweet night. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I don't know why you're a leader for something. You have a vision and they don't think you're mad. And then you get this stuff. The quite clear, it's in your genes. That if you haven't got the proper value, the proper values, you must be. And only people have the right values to work in my organization. Now, interestingly, there is only one organization in history who has successfully implemented a single culture vision and value. successfully, it lasted for over 10 years. It was Germany in the 1930s. Then you get these things. You get your culture, your vision, your values, you write down the strategy. Nice thing with this document. And then what you do is you get objectives within the strategy. You almost get no subjects, no object, objects. No. Then you get some fabulous people. Leadership as you can be charged champions. Oh, and you can see this is getting a little bit aggressive now, isn't it? Yeah, and then don't be like the mission, you tell you what mission is like that. And then we talk about frontline services. Ah, and then what we find is the bloody process is not working. And then we go back to where we started. <laughs> Welcome to Game Juice, thank you. Depressing. But fortunately, there is a better way of doing this. And this idea that these two things fight is, is not. Um, I'll give you a good example of, uh, of the difference. On one side, you've got recipe books. Now they are pretty useful, aren't they? As long as you've got all the ingredients and the right kitchen, hmm. someone who can read. Isn't it? Because generally, then you can follow a recipe and get it good at cooking, isn't it? Trouble is, <coughs> it, your fridge looks like a bomb, so you know, it's full of beans and like beans. And, uh, and you get half the kitchen doesn't work. And all of a sudden, the recipe is useless. Then you need the bloke on the other side. Now he can walk into anybody's kitchen, find any old thing going around and produce something in a food. Because he's got an apprenticeship in what you do with food. His aunt can do things that his head doesn't have to be engaged in. And we can actually, you know, look at any old ingredients and put it together in the right way. If something's missing, he knows what to put in place. So he can have his navigate to your own kitchen. I think we need 
need more chefs and less recipe books. Is that uh, just a bet with you know, again. If anyone in the room can recognize what that is, then you get extra revenue points. Because you've got to be a real geek to recognize what that is. But the idea that some things are mechanical and linear and lined up, and that's an MRI scanner without these case on. Right? We do want MRI scanners to work really well for me and to be really reliable because they have the potential to kill people. <laughs> so I'd like them to work stuff. But actually, much of our work is more like this. It's more like gardening than engineering, isn't it? Because actually, gardening is this thing. You don't uh, prioritize your garden. <laughs> you might do a few bits, but then you plant stuff. If it looks crap, you dig it up. It looks great. You walk it. You know, sometimes patterns are in a way really crap, but you can love it anyway. You know, you can tend it, take a while, things grow nice, you can get grapefruit, got crap trees. You know, gardening is things you can actually do with your hands, you can get involved in, whereas engineering has got to be done. This shift in perspective takes a huge amount of effort for people who are behind in this way of working it. The fact is that you can just get on with gardening, people can participate to whatever level they're capable. And actually, it's not about evaluating how great the garden is, it's the process of gardening that is the good thing. But the worst gardening is sitting in it watching it. Well, actually, yeah, that's quite good, especially with that. And we need the shift in perspective from this idea that it's all based on committees and problem solving and these big hierarchies, to this idea that you can turn your back on your problems and actually make them relevant. You can work in networks, work in communities, and there are more opportunities to be found. And, and I don't forget, mine. If you cross this dotted line from that way of working to this way of working, you will not be willing to go back because this is more than that. So how do you work in a community? How do you work in that community of people who practice, not just talk about things, but who actually practice together and do things together? There's a nice book from a long time ago. Um, as a result of, he says himself, my dad here, my dear, um, smoking some very unusual cigarettes in California. <laughs> on a long conference um, with a monthly history group of people. And uh, he wrote this book, he was practice, but actually it was about, do you know what? Learning is not like the way we structure it. You know, sitting there, soaking up things the teacher tells you, and then single pencil combat to see who's the best at the end of the year. But actually, it's a social process. You sit in rooms and you share with people that you trust. Huh? I've, I used this a lot, a lot of the years, and that's, that's Etienne. And I've used this, this methodology a few different times, different ways. Um, there's something to know about community practice. First thing is, there's a shared domain of interest, but there is something that brings people together that they are interested in. You cannot be sent. You have to have an interest in the subject that forms the core of a community of people coming together. It needs that thing. Um, it needs a group of people who meet. Over the internet, it's not a community practice. You've actually got to get into the room. You've got to immerse yourself in doing things with people and developing relationships with them. Because it's only in the doing of it and the being immersed in it does it make real sense to you. And you need a common practice. So in other words, you've got to do the thing that is the domain. So if you lot were all interested in horror films, right? And you got together because you love horror films, you couldn't be a community practice because you don't make horror films. Does that make sense? So just having an interest isn't good enough. You have to be somebody who activates themselves, who actually does the task that is the domain. Okay. And those three different rules are just about the only rules we need. Um, you've got to have this shared domain of interest and go too big and it becomes unwieldy, go too small and it becomes niche. Be a bit careful, right, because fluffy bunnies, right? The people who live in rational hierarchy land think that anything that's involved meeting people and talking to them is some kind of fluffy hippie nonsense. There is more evidence out there in the academic literature for using a method of bringing people together to share experience and drive change as the correct method than there is for any other of the process development kind of ways to do it, the industrial engineering stuff. There is more evidence that this works. That's it, isn't it? Most people don't know about all that evidence because it's much more convenient to find one of the bits of process, isn't it? Um, these are just 10 years worth of having all this. Pictures from some of the people who joined in. A long time ago, we started a care planning workshop. Um, and that turned into a little network of people who spent a lot of time of different professions trying to plan other people's care and how frustratingly difficult it was. Uh, that then went on to a piece of work, uh, a national piece of work, around unified assessment. Uh, and what on earth did unified assessment mean? Well, 
Then we got this one up in Berlin, which was a result of some of the care planning work where we created a document called Class and Black. We wrote a piece of national policy in the community practice with 150 contributors from 30 different organizations. <coughs> so we can do some amazing work in the space of 12 months. That was an incredible piece of work that was launched all the time. That was also care, but how you actually plan women's care. The idea is that you don't achieve, you don't pass the back, you pass the back. It's a responsibility for caring for people. That worked really well, it's good practice. We got some discharge and assistance fell out of that, actually, and they became an expert who, who uh, provided a load of training, and they still meet on a regular basis. Uh, we had an intermediate care group, remember that she mentioned, set of the direction earlier on? Um, which that set of the direction policy, which was written by um, Chris Jones, the chairman of Kuntak Health Authority. Half of it was written by, and informed by, community practice, who actually provided me with the content about how you actually go about putting people together across disciplines. Um, the challenge of the year, right? It's it, one of the most successful ones. Um, it, um, we set it up a few years ago as a, as a national network, multidisciplinary, across its boundaries, to look at people with challenging behaviour and to talk about practice and discuss how we educate and help people with those kind of problems. And, um, and what happened with Winterborne View? Familiar with Winterborne View? People with disabilities being physically, mentally abused by the people who you know, contracted care for them. And what that community practice did was wrote to the deputy minister at the time and said, when the, uh, we've got a national network who looks at and works with people with a disability, this is what we can do for you. And when they give them a mandate and funding, and they are still going eight years later. So there now seems an expert reference group that link into the LT advisory group for Wales and the fabulous, fabulously self-sustaining um, community. Um, False collaborative at six years in, I think, at the moment, multidisciplinary, based in the community, all around how you support people when they fall over, preferably to help them fall over properly. So they don't hurt themselves. There's an interesting conversation, but you can't stop people falling over. You can have a petition to fall over properly so that they don't hurt themselves. It's nice. <laughs> people go down, go down well. <laughs> and actually, if you're a bit drunk, it's helpful. Because you go down gently. <laughs> If you're very drunk or you're not drunk at all, you fall over worse. So a couple of glasses of wine a day, you'll be fine. Um, complex Care Forum, this was one of our big scary ones that had in the end 600 members across the whole of Wales who contributed and about 100 people got together on a regular basis. And we actually informed national policy on particularly in NHS health care and did a number of really passionate pieces of work from people who did it for a living. And uh, I currently run a profound about balloon disability community practice. Uh, which is coming into its third meeting shortly, uh, where we're looking at a very, very uh, complex group of people with uh, typically an IQ under 20, no communication skills whatsoever, with possible issues in lifelong care, and about how we look after those. Uh, those are very interesting people. And finally, we're about to kick off something around abnormalism. So, in the last few years, we've run a lot of national networks that have been very successful. And one of the things is they're all multidisciplinary, none of them were mandated by anybody. They started because they were and they were self-sustaining, self-organizing. They chose the work that they did, and the work that they did, we had to plug into other priorities that existed. Fabulous. One of the things is, with community practice, that occasionally you've got to kill them off. Big in task, slightly. Um, if they're not going anywhere, they're not being successful, you can't hold on to them, you've got to let them die. Let them switch off, let them close down, because then you can spend your energy on another one. And a couple of those have, have changed their focus over the years, and change into other things. A few of them are starting to finish, but they have discreet pieces of work that pass the back and is published. So we had a celebration and stopped talking to each other, which is nice. Uh, but you've got a sense of all the different types of things that work. Uh, this is what a community practice does. Imagine a community in the middle, which is a network of people with an interest in a subject. Um, it's made up of people in the field. We get to a design strategy and policy. We do that by, first of all, taking the experience from actually living this work and bring it into a forum, into a place to share it. We debate those experiences. Then what we do is we share those experiences, we take it back with us. We say, this is the rule one. We'll, whatever I learn to the rule, I'll take back with me and I'll try and put it in my own practice. Because if I try to change the way that you do things. We then offer these people up here an opportunity to engage with people who really know their subject. And if you bring something to the rule, we've done this with several policy needs, only one is tried. Because we turned the whole policy around upside down in about five minutes. 
Um, what they get to get back with is real solutions. So as you put a community practice together, you have an incredible amount of knowledge in one place of the domain. There are incredible problem solvers. So what you get is this lovely figure of eight motion where you advocate for the practice, share the experiences, and have a forum that people can come to and you can really genuinely influence the natural process. They work really well. And that's a rule. And you can have one, but it's not a read note. Things to think about when you're setting one up and how you manage yourselves. Um, but the best rules are that this one of this. You've got to be slightly sneaky. Mm. Being a bit devious is part of the method. You know, finding ways of getting the thing done that you want done. Isn't that so terrible? Community um, practice is a living thing on a machine. You need a few ground rules set to direction, but they're not a committee. You don't need agendas, prioritization. You get this rhythm, find rhythm, and that rhythm is this wonderful thing that you find a way of working together that kind of suits the room, and when you come back it seems familiar, and you can, instead of starting every conversation from scratch, you carry on from the last one. And in fact, people who come to the last PMLT community practice said, oh my God, it only seems five minutes since we were here last time, because they kind of look forward to it. Um, this is a strange thing. I'll pick up this to look at it again. The six hour room, six hour room is fascinating. When you push people to talk about their favourite subject for a while, they start off by sitting against and being very polite. Yeah, you know, and not doing anything very much. And about six hours in, talking to you, which is halfway through the Sunday meeting, somebody does this. Oh, shit, did I have enough of this? Let me go to rubbish. I want to do this, that, and the other thing. And somebody else says, I'm so glad you said that. I feel like that as well. And somebody else goes, yes! And the energy comes out all of a sudden. And it, it happens in about six hours. And we geared towards it. And it was great in the last uh, PMLD one, because it happened all of a sudden. What it is, is people suddenly get over themselves. And they think, oh, I can trust this room. I can trust these people, so I can say something the way I really feel about stuff. And I, I know nobody's going to have to tip me with me, but I can actually push it a bit further. I can tell them what I'm doing. It's a safe place. And that six hour room, we've, we've seen in every one of those community practice comes out. That way where people suddenly start being, you know, enjoying themselves, being a lot more open. But it does take a while to get there. And that's what I think it's a big point for the first two. Um, and they've got to be, most of all, intellectually stimulated. There's nothing worse than coming into a room with people, like many people, and being bored to death, isn't it? With didactic stuff, like something like this, the presentation sort of like this happened. And you, you, you really practice runs on this thing. This is its power. So you might want to make a note of this. You have to see the diversity as an asset, which is very interesting if you were uh, picking that up earlier on. The more diverse the community practice, the greater its ability to do things. So you may want to write this down. Um, that's the equation for how you measure the diversity of your crowd. Um, this is uh, Dan Page, a professor in, uh, in MIT. Uh, this is called the Diversity Prediction Theorem. And I might need you to know. Um, so all it means is the error in a crowd is equal to the error in each average person minus the diversity of those people. Fabulous. That the more diverse the crowd is, the greater that diversity makes your collective view accurate. Because if you were all the same and you saw the world in one particular way, that one particular way is probably a description of who you are, isn't it? Rather than what you think about the world. It'll be what you think. Whereas actually, if you get a diverse crowd, you have a range of perspectives on the same subject, and that range of perspectives gives you a much more holistic or whole picture of the subject. It's a fascinating way to do things, and you can actually measure it. It's not fluffy. So there is a job that you do that, it's a people joining the team up. This is a real person, don't they? <laughs> they were caught on Google Cars, if anyone was to follow them over there. So this is on Google Maps, to find this poor lady. Um, have you heard of the fundamental attribution error? <coughs> that means that if you see somebody falling over in the street, no matter what a kind person you are, how nice you are, your instant reaction will be, look at that clumsy fool falling on the street. If you fall on the street, you go, who put that there? Because you're not a clumsy fool, you? So when you don't know people, it's much easier to attribute them an, an attribute. Say they are clumsy, fat, lazy, stupid, whatever it is, rather to understand that, that person may be rushing or they're partially sighted. Or, or all those other things. So we are all guilty of a 
spend the next attribution error. You do it all the time. And you have to, as a normal human being, you can't stop and try and understand everything that you observe in the day because you wouldn't be particularly productive, would you? So it's okay, but you can combat it by doing this, unconditional positive regard. It's a great phrase used by psychotherapists because it's really hard to say. <laughs> so what you do is you say it in your mind. Go on, do it now. Got it? Unconditional positive regard. It's a framing tool to remind you that no matter what the situation or circumstances in here, a good person. They are an asset, they have stuff that is valuable. And we use this influence in practice as no matter what people say or think, you've got to look at them as an asset. But that difference in view is positive, that there's a good person within there somewhere. I have to admit, for some people you have to look a bloody long time to find them. <laughs> I'm going to end this little thing with an example of one of the things we do in English practice. Can I quickly ask, does, if, does anybody in the room here not know somebody else in the room? You all know somebody else in the room. So, so you do? Good, because we're going to play a little game. It's going to take two minutes. So in a moment, you're going to get up, you're going to go to the person in the room that you know, and you're going to perform a little task. Right. The hippie warning is Nancy Klein is a proper hippie, right? House trees, she wouldn't light a candle because it's like burning itself. Okay? But she says the human mind thinks more rigorously and creatively in the context of genuine appreciation. People around you get you research. You can be more free, more creative. Uh, you have to be a little bit careful because nothing works less than a room full of optimists. They're so busy being happy and in cupboards. So you need um, you need a list writer. Is it good? Don't you loves a list? Oh, we properly loves a list. I'm my man. Oh, my word. She, she makes a little noise. She has lists and lists. Right? So if one of her lists gets to a certain point, she does this, she goes, oh, because she needs to rewrite it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not qualified for decision making or planning in my house. She says, get your quota, you say, yes, I'm going to go. <laughs> in fact, that's how we've got to get the living, actually. Um, <laughs> so we're going to do something. You've heard of the shit sandwich, haven't you? You've heard of that, have you? <coughs> you have been found. Your report was crap. Should we go for lunch? <laughs> do you see how we did that, then? <laughs> what Nancy says, that if you show some genuine appreciation, you can, you can really deeply criticise somebody. And offer them real insight to who they are and what they need to sort out. But only if you give them lots of trust first and lots of positive affirmation, you appreciate them. And if they feel genuinely appreciated, you will take criticism from someone who appreciates you, won't you? So uh, you're going to appreciate one another. Just for a few seconds, I'm going to ask you to go and find the person that you know, and I'm going to ask you to say something about that person that you genuinely appreciate. They're a rule. Succinct, don't plan on. Well, you know that thing that time when you did that thing and something, you will remember. Be sincere, for God's sake, don't say anything unless you really do believe it. Because when you're that close to somebody, they can tell you're lying. <laughs> so be sincere. And be specific. That's a lovely talk. It's not good enough, right? It's got to be about the person, okay? So you got that? Short, sharp, true, specific. That, and when you've given that little appreciation of somebody, they're going to give it back to you. Is that okay? You've only got a couple of minutes, so it's really quick. You ready? Ready to go? <laughs> then you get me. <laughs> okay, go. How, do I have to ask pretty? How, how did that feel? How did that feel? Good? Embarrassing. Embarrassing. I noticed that even, even the men in the room suddenly went, <laughs> Was it easy to say something appreciative? Yeah. 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 How did it feel? Nice. Nice there. Flesh, isn't it? <laughs> I, I, I worked with a, uh, a, a bunch of speed team, I can't tell you where, cardiology and UHW, uh, who, who bloody ate each other. And I made them do that to start the meeting. <laughs> it was, it was teeth pullingly bad the first time, and then they're still doing it. Because it changes the way that they converse with people. It's really simple, isn't it? You're going to have that up in a minute. Really easy to do. Um, and I, and I get this. This is the kind of the phrase which sums it up for me about how valuable some of that simple stuff is. That it's a quote from Einstein, and he says, The intuitive mind is a sacred gift, the rational mind a faithful servant. We have created a society that honors the servant, but has forgotten the gift. 